We sing in response to the sermon, Psalter 425, the stanzas 4 and 5. Beloved congregation, clarifications are sometimes necessary. The Apostle Paul, in his writings, often makes such clarifications. He'll make a statement, an important doctrinal statement, and then in the sentence immediately following that, he will clarify his meaning. I think, for example, of Romans chapter 5, verse 21, at the very end of that chapter, comes out clear in the King James Version. Paul says this, he says, As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And that ends the chapter, that verse. And then at the beginning of chapter 6, verse 1, Paul clarifies his meaning. He asks, what shall we say then? And he uses that phrase more often in his writings. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer he gives is, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now that has nothing to do with the sermon tonight, but it's just an illustration of how clarifications are sometimes necessary sometimes very important, and the Apostle Paul uses them regularly. Well, so does our catechism. Last time, in Lord's Day 26, we considered the meaning of the sacrament of holy baptism. And we learned that baptism points us to Christ. And it points us to our need to be washed in the blood of Christ. So that just as water, physical water, washes away the dirt from our body, so the blood of Christ washes away the sin of our soul. And now in Lord's Day 27, in the Lord's Day that we read just a few moments ago, our catechism seeks to clarify that teaching. And it does really two things here. First of all, it clarifies the meaning of baptism. And it does that over and against one part of the teaching of Roman Catholics. And then it goes on to clarify the recipients of baptism, and it does that over and against the teaching of the Anabaptists. We'll come back to that in a moment. And in this way, our catechism seeks to defend and preserve this vital, precious, and comforting truth of the Word of God. So with the Lord's help, we want to consider the doctrine of holy baptism clarified. That's our theme. The doctrine of holy baptism clarified. And we'll consider, as I said, that it is clarified, first of all, as to its meaning, and secondly, as to its recipients. If you have your Psalters open to Lord's Day 27, you'll see that it begins with this question. Is then the external baptism with water, the washing away of sin itself. Now remember that in the previous Lord's Day, Lord's Day 26, we learned that holy baptism, that in holy baptism, Christ assures us that he will wash us in his blood and by his spirit. And that by his blood, he washes away the guilt of sin, and by his Spirit, he washes away the pollution of sin. Well, now our catechism wants to know whether it is the water itself that does this. Is then the external baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? Now, in asking that question, Our catechism is seeking to clarify the meaning of baptism over and against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, which you remember at this time when the catechism was written, the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant church in Europe, and it's out of that church that we as Protestants came. And this is one of the reasons why we left the Roman Catholic Church. It has to do with their teaching on holy baptism. What do they teach? Well, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that when a child is baptized, 
that grace is imparted to the child through the water, through the physical water. So that the water of baptism actually, they teach, washes away original sin. The sin that we are born with. The sin that we receive from our parents and ultimately from Adam and Eve. When a child is baptized, that water washes away that sin. It also, it does more than that, it infuses into the child who is being baptized the grace of regeneration. So that the child, when it is baptized, becomes regenerated. It is born again. And it is enabled then to live a holy life. And we call that baptismal regeneration. That regeneration comes through baptism. Now, where do they get this from? Well, they base this, they try to base this on, they claim to base this on the Scriptures. And I want you to look up two verses of Scripture with me. The first is Titus 3, verse 5. And I'm going to give you the Pew Bible reference, 1171. Page 1171 in your Pew Bible. Titus 3, verse 5. Page 1171, just so that you can look it up real quick. So Paul writes here, that we're saved not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, listen carefully now, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. What's he talking about here? Well, he is talking about baptism. But you'll notice how he refers to baptism. He's calling it the washing of regeneration. And so Roman Catholics pick up on this and they say, well, see, there you have it. The water of baptism actually imparts the grace of regeneration, that through baptism our children are regenerated. They are born again, and their sins are washed away. They also base this on another verse of Scripture, Acts 22, verse 16. That's page 1096 in your pew Bible. 1096, Acts 22, verse 16. Paul there is recalling his conversion to Christ. And then you remember how he was in Damascus and Ananias came to him and um, he was supposed to put his hands on him so that Saul could receive his sight again. And so Paul is recalling this. And so he says in Acts 22, verse 16, he quotes Ananias as saying to him, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Now that verse also seems to be saying that baptism, the water of baptism, actually washes away our sin. But is that true? That's the question that our catechism is asking here. Is then the external baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? Notice the answer. It is clear, it is unequivocal, not at all. It's pretty strong. So it's not just that there may be some truth to this view. Our catechism is asserting that there's no truth to that view at all. And why not? Why is the external baptism, the washing of water, why is it that that water does not wash away sin itself? Well, here's the answer. Because only the blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost cleanse us from all sin. The reason why the water of baptism does not wash away our sins is because the water of baptism can't do that. Only the blood and the Spirit of Christ can do that. Now that's exactly what the Scriptures teach. And we'll come back to the two verses I mentioned earlier, but let's look at what the Scriptures teach. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6, page 1122 in your pew Bible, page 1122. 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 9, Paul says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Which, by the way, Paul is not saying here that these people cannot be saved. He's saying that so long as they continue in these sins, they will not be saved. But we'll set that aside. He's talking about people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this, and such were some of you. He's addressing believers in the church at Corinth. He's saying, this is the kind of people you were before you came to Christ. But now listen to what he says next. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. How were they washed? How were they sanctified? How were they justified? Not by the water of baptism, but, he says, by the Spirit of our God. You can't get any clearer than that. I give you another verse, 1 John 1, verse 7, page 1195 in your Bible, page 1195. 1 John 1, verse 7. John says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and, listen carefully, and the blood of of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. So what is it that cleanses us from all sin? Is it the water of baptism? No. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll give you one more verse. Revelation 1, page 1203. Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5, page 1203. John is in the island of Patmos and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ, and he speaks about Christ in, page, in verse 4. I believe it's verse 4. I don't have it in front of me. I'm just reading my notes here, but I believe it's in verse 4. He says that Christ loved us, and listen carefully, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There you have it again. How did Christ wash us from our sins? Not with the water of baptism, but in his blood own blood. So the testimony of Scripture is clear. The water of baptism doesn't do anything for us or for our children. It's just the element. And it's wrong, really, for sometimes, we'll come back to that later, but it's, it's, it's wrong for our Baptist brethren, when they know that we baptize infants, they right away come to the conclusion that, that we think that baptism saves our children. It doesn't. We don't, we don't say that. We don't teach that here. We don't believe that. Baptism doesn't save our children. The water of baptism doesn't do anything for the child. It's just water. After the baptism is over, it gets thrown down the sink. I'm sorry to be so crude about it, but that's, that's true. It's just, the, it's just the element that's used. It's the sign that is used that for the period in which we are worshiping and in which we are administering the sacrament. But there's nothing holy about that water, nothing special about that water. It's just ordinary water. Only the blood and the Spirit of Christ can wash away our sins. That's true for us, and it's true also for our children. Now, if that is true, why then do the Scriptures use this kind of language? Why do the Scriptures refer to baptism as the washing of regeneration and the washing away of of sins. And that's a question that our catechism asks in question and answer 73. And there we have two reasons why the scriptures use this kind of language. Two reasons why the scriptures refer to baptism as the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. And the first reason is this, to teach us something. To teach us something. To teach us what? Well, look at what our catechism says. That as the filth of the body is purged away by water, so our sins are removed by the blood and spirit of Jesus Christ. So here our catechism is referring to the water as a sign. And it's saying that the water of baptism is a sign of the blood of Christ. So that just, as I said before, just as water washes away the dirt from our bodies, children, if your hands are dirty, you're going to go into the, into the bathroom, you're going to turn on the tap, and you're going to wash your hands under the water. 
If you just wash your hands with a bar of soap without any water, it's not going to come clean, is it? You need that water. And so what God is teaching us in baptism is that just as water washes away the dirt from our bodies, so the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. So that's why the Bible, that's the first reason why the Bible uses this kind of language, to teach us this. But then there's another reason. It's especially to assure us. To assure us of what? Well, again, look at our catechism. That we are spiritually cleansed from our sins as really as we are externally washed with water. Now here, our catechism is referring to baptism not as a sign now, but as a seal. And it's saying that baptism seals that which it signifies, which is the washing away of our sins by the blood of Christ. The point is that when the Scriptures use this kind of language, when the Scriptures speak of baptism as the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins, it's only seeking to reinforce what baptism signifies. It's telling us that the water of baptism and the washing of regeneration and the washing away of our sins are so closely connected that they're, they're described in Scripture as though they're not, but as though they are one and the same thing. We call that sacramental language. We use this kind of language ourselves, even though we may not be aware of it. For example, if I show you a photo of my family and all my children, my wife and children are on that photo, and somebody says, who's this? And they're pointing, let's say, to my son Andrew. I will say, well, that's Andrew. And if they say, well, who's that? I say they're pointing to my, my daughter Lydia. This, I, I'll say, well, that's Lydia. Now, is that really Andrew? Of course not. It's just a representation of Andrew. But, but I'm, I'm using language as though that is Andrew himself. Or that that is Lydia herself. It's just a photo. But it's an accurate representation of who they are. And that's the language of Scripture, too. The Scriptures refer to baptism as the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. It's not saying, this is where we part company with Roman Catholics, it's not saying that the water of baptism actually washes away sin. That's impossible. Because as we've seen, only the blood and spirit of Christ can wash away our sins. What it is saying is that this is what baptism signifies and seals. And it signifies and seals these things so powerfully that the sign and seal are equated with the thing that is signified and sealed. Now, you see how the Holy Spirit, in using this kind of language, that the Holy Spirit is seeking to increase our assurance. That's the point of this. It's not to confuse us, not to lead us into all kinds of error, but the Holy Spirit is using this language to assure us that what baptism signifies and seals is really true. It's as though the Scriptures, in using this language, is saying to us, Every time that you see a person being baptized, think of how the water washes away the dirt from our bodies. And then you think of the blood of Christ. And you think how the blood of Christ washes away the sin of our soul. Well, every time you see a person being baptized, you may rest assured, if you are in Christ, you may rest assured that all of your sins have indeed been washed away. This is precisely why I said last week, this is precisely why when, when, when Martin Luther was assailed by the devil and by doubts and fears concerning his own spiritual condition before God, that he would take that slate and he would write with a piece of chalk in big letters, I am baptized. His hope was not in his baptism. 
His hope was in Christ. He knew that the only way he could be saved was by the blood of Jesus Christ, was by faith in Christ alone. But his baptism was an objective reminder of the reality that all of his sins had been washed away. And therefore, let the devil say what he will. Let my conscience accuse me. My baptism tells me otherwise. My baptism objectively reminds me all my sins are washed away. I have peace with God. I am clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that when I die and I must stand before God on the day of judgment, I don't have to be afraid. I may stand before him without fear, for God regards me as I am in Christ, as though I had never sinned and on that basis will declare me not guilty and welcome me with open arms into his eternal kingdom. So the point is the external water of baptism doesn't wash away sin. Only the blood and spirit of Christ can do that. And we're reminded here again, aren't we, congregation, of our great need for Christ. If you're not in Christ this afternoon, you are in great danger. If you're not in Christ, your sins are not washed away. And if your sins are not washed away, then you stand before God under his wrath and condemnation. And if you stand under the wrath and condemnation of God, then the Bible says you will surely be condemned to everlasting damnation in hell. That's the reality. And this is why we need Christ. This is why we need to be washed in the blood and by the Spirit of Christ. And if you're not in Christ, I urge you again, come to him. Come to him. He alone can wash away your sin. He alone can present you faultless before the throne of God. He alone can grant you entrance into everlasting life. And so this Lord's Day clarifies the meaning of holy baptism. But then it goes on to clarify its recipients. That's my second point. If you have your Psalter's open still to Lord's Day 27, look at question 74. There, the question is asked, are infants also to be baptized? Now, that's a very controversial question. Are infants also to be baptized? And there are many Christians, Bible-believing, faithful people of God, who will answer that question in the negative. They will say, no, infants are not to be baptized. Now, let me give you some historical context. For hundreds of years, no one in the church, in the Christian church, questioned this. Infant baptism was universally accepted throughout Europe, throughout what we call Christendom, as thoroughly biblical. All children in Christendom were baptized, both in the Roman Catholic Church as well as in the Greek Orthodox Church, which were the two churches that existed side by side throughout the Middle Ages. Nobody questioned this. Everybody accepted that infants of believers ought to be baptized. Now, that began to change during the time of the Reformation, there were ta- during that time, the 16th century, the 1500s, there were people who questioned this, and we call them Anabaptists. And they are the spiritual ancestors, we could say, of modern-day Baptists and Pentecostals and, and any other denomination that, that believes in credo rather than pedo baptism Now, let's understand something very clearly, the Anabaptists were Protestants, just like the Reformed are Protestants. And as Protestants, they affirmed the truths that the Reformers taught. 
For example, they, they affirmed that the Scriptures are the only rule of faith and practice. They affirmed that we're saved by grace through faith alone. They affirmed that we're justified by grace through faith alone. And they also opposed many of the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. For example, the teaching on indulgences that Martin Luther spoke up so strongly against. They also didn't believe in the supremacy of the Pope and in praying to saints and the doctrine of purgatory and and the veneration of, of saints and the exaltation of Mary. So they were totally on board with the Reformers on all of these different things. But they differed with the Reformers on this point, on infant baptism. They believed that the leaders of the Reformation, men like John Calvin and, and John Knox and Luther and Zwingli, that, that they did not go far enough in reforming the church. In their view, they should have done away with this as well. They should have done away with infant baptism. And they said that because in their view, baptizing infants was unbiblical. They said it was a leftover of the false teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore it also should be abolished. Only those who profess faith in Christ should be baptized. Now, as I said, there are many Bible-believing, sincere children of God who believe the same today. In fact, I would say, generally speaking, the Protestant church today is divided probably quite equally between those who affirm infant baptism and those who do not. Certainly among evangelicals, the majority is definitely those who are not in favor of infant baptism. But beloved, while we embrace our Baptist brethren and sisters in Christ, and I mean that with all my heart, though we regard them as our brothers and sisters and we, we have so much in common with them, we, we have to disagree with them on this point. And, and in saying this, I, I'm fully aware that there are some in our midst this afternoon who, who fit in that category, who don't see the argument for infant baptism, who, who've never perhaps been instructed in the argument for infant baptism, never, never heard of it before, never heard an argument in favor of it before, and, and therefore, therefore, they're not in favor of it. Now, what I'm going to do in the time that I have left is try to, try to s give you a sketch of, of the argument for infant baptism, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I can't do that tonight. If you want more detail on this, you can always join us uh, this Tuesday night uh, for our uh, class on infant baptism, uh, but, but let me just say this, that our catechism in question and answer 74 gives four reasons, four reasons why infants are to be baptized. Remember, this is just the thumbnail sketch. There's so much more that can be said about this. I only have time to give you a sketch. The first argument is this, that children as well as adults are included in the covenant and church of God. Children as well as adults are included in the covenant and church of God. God. What covenant is this? This is the covenant of grace. And God established that covenant with Abraham back in Genesis 17. And in verse 7 of Genesis 17, God came to Abraham and he said, I will establish my covenant between you and your seed after you in your generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. You, mention, you, you hear mention twice of the word seed. The covenant is made not just with Abraham, but also with his seed, with his children. And the sign and seal of that covenant, as he goes on to explain in Genesis 17, is the sign of circumcision. Now that covenant that God made with Abraham many thousands of years ago, we believe, is still the same covenant that he makes with believers and their children today. 
Now, there's a whole argument that I can use to prove that, but just let me underscore the one word that we find in Genesis 17, verse 7, and that's that word everlasting. Everlasting. I will make an everlasting covenant, God says. God says that. And when God says everlasting, he means everlasting. He doesn't just mean until the time of the New Testament or until the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He means forever. He means this covenant that I'm making with Abraham will endure to all generations. To a thousand generations. And if that is true, then our children are still included in that covenant. And if they are still included in that covenant, then they must receive the sign and seal of that covenant which is no longer circumcision, we'll come back to that in a minute, but which is now holy baptism. So that's the first reason. Our children are included in the covenant and church of God. Second reason why we baptize infants. It says here that redemption from sin by the blood of Christ and the Holy Ghost is promised to children no less than to adults. Now that is true. And we read earlier from Acts chapter 2. And in verse 39 of Acts chapter 2, Peter says this to the Jews who were pricked in their hearts, who were convicted of their sins. Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. And then he goes on to say, for the promise is unto you and to your children. So you see, what Peter is saying is that nothing has changed. The promises of God have always been for you and for your children. It isn't true that the promises of the gospel now are only for those who believe, only for those who who make a confession of faith in Christ. No, the promises are also for the children. And that indicates that these children, that further indicates that these children are part of the covenant. They're part of a relationship with God that God himself has brought them into a relationship with himself and has extended to them certain promises, obligations as well to be sure, but also promises. And because of that, they ought to be baptized. Third reason why we baptize infants is to distinguish the children of believers from children of unbelievers. Baptism is a mark of distinction. It doesn't mean that our children are better than the children of unbelievers. They're not. They have wicked, sinful hearts. And our children, they also need to be born again. They need to be recreated. They need to be converted to God. Absolutely, we don't undermine that at all. And the call of the gospel comes not just to unbelievers out there, but it comes also to our children right here in the congregation. Nevertheless, there is a distinction between our children and the children of the world. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, I preached a sermon on those verses on that verse a little while ago Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 speaks about the children of even one believing parent as holy that's the word that he uses holy doesn't mean internally holy doesn't mean our children are without sin he means externally holy it means he means they have been set apart by God they're placed in a special relationship with God Just as circumcision marked out the children of the Jews in the Old Testament as being special to God, so baptism does the same in the New Testament. Our children are distinguished from the children of unbelievers. And for that reason, they are to be baptized. And then the fourth reason that is given here is that baptism replaces circumcision. This is kind of the hinge argument, isn't it? 
And Baptists will often focus their attention on, on this particular argument, and they'll, they'll train their, their, their artillery, so to speak, on this argument in particular, because uh, if that is not true, if baptism doesn't replace circumcision, then the whole argument falls apart. But we believe that baptism does replace circumcision. Just as the Lord's Supper replaces the Passover feast, so baptism replaces circumcision. Where do we find that in the Bible? You find it in Colossians chapter 2. Again, I don't have the time to get into this. You can take my course. But Colossians 2, 11 and 12, Paul there reminds the Colossians, these were Gentile Christians, he reminds the Colossians that they were circumcised. This is the language that he uses, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now that's an interesting expression. The circumcision made without hands. What is that? How do you circumcise a male child without hands? That's impossible, of course. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about male circumcision. He's talking about baptism. He's saying that baptism is the circumcision made without hands. And he goes on to clarify that in verse 12 when he when he tells the Colossians that they were buried with him, with Christ, in baptism. And there he uses uses that word baptism. So there's a connection. At the very least, you have to see that there's a connection between baptism and circumcision. Now, if you study this in the Greek, you know that grammatically the phrase buried with him in baptism modifies or explains the previous verse. So what Paul is saying is this, that to be circumcised with the circumcision made without hands means to be buried with Christ in baptism. And so this is where we get the argument that baptism replaces circumcision. And if infants of believers were circumcised in the Old Covenant, then they must be baptized in the new. Now, that's the argument. Now, our Baptist brethren, they disagree with us, as I've said. What do they argue? It's important for us to understand their arguments, too. I mean, it's easy just to say, well, this is what we believe, and forget about, you know, who cares what the Baptists say. That's not fair. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. They also have their arguments. What do they argue over and against what we believe, and how do we answer that? Well, again, this is a complicated subject, and I can only deal with this in a thumbnail kind of way, but let me just say, first of all, they point out, for example, that in Mark 16, the very last chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 15 and 16, after Jesus commissions his disciples to go out into all the world and preach the Gospel, gives them the Great Commission, Jesus says this. This It's a favorite verse of our Baptist brethren. He says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so they rightly point out that the order of the text says that first one believes and then he is baptized. That is the order of the text. We don't argue with that. And then they argue that since infants cannot believe, therefore they cannot be baptized. Now how do we respond to that? Well, sometimes we reform people. We just sort of, you know, we, we, somebody confronts us with that argument. We don't know what to say. And we think, we think, well, yeah, maybe, maybe we shouldn't believe in infant baptism after all. We begin to question. We begin to doubt, and it happens a lot. And reformed people just are so easily persuaded by Baptist arguments. And I have to admit that some of them are quite convincing. But that they, I was going to say they throw the baby with the bathwater, but that would be. Uh, that would be a pun. But th- that's what happens. And they end up joining a, re- a Baptist church and they think, well, yeah, these Reformed people are very sincere. But on this point, yeah, they really haven't got it all worked out. So we looked at an argument like that and we say, well, yeah, what do we say? Is there something to say? Yeah, we can say something about that. We can remind our Baptist brethren that Jesus here is speaking in a certain context. And you can't divorce these words from their context. Jesus here is sending out his disciples into all the world to preach the gospel. And what are they going to do? They're going to preach the gospel. And who are going to believe that gospel? It's not going to be infants. Because they're not capable of understanding. But it's going to be adults. It's going to be people who have reached full maturity, full understanding. 
These are the people who are going to come to faith through the preaching of the apostles. And therefore, it is only right and proper that they be baptized. It only makes sense that they're the ones who are going to believe, and therefore, upon believing, they must be baptized. Now, we do the same thing today. If, 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 a, if an adult person from the world comes to faith in Christ, he's going to have to make, he or she's going to make confession of faith before the congregation, and then we are going to baptize that person. We're not doing anything different than what the apostles did in the New Testament era. Before being baptized, adult believers must confess their faith. But that does not apply to infants of believers. And Jesus is not addressing infants in this verse. Second argument Baptists make is this. They say that there is no explicit command in Scripture to baptize children. There's no explicit demand in Scripture to baptize children. And you know what? They're absolutely right. I can't point to a single verse in the New Testament that says, you must baptize your infants. It doesn't say that anywhere. We freely and fully admit that. But, beloved, that's an argument from silence. We might as well say that women should not come to the Lord's Supper because the Bible doesn't explicitly command that women should come to the Lord's Supper. If anything, the onus is on our Baptist brethren to prove that infants should not be baptized. Because if for thousands of years children were included in the covenant and received the sign and seal of the covenant, then we would expect to find some verse, perhaps even an entire chapter, of the New Testament devoted to this subject stating to us in clear and uncertain, time, uncertain terms that this is no longer the case, that children were included in the Old Covenant, but now they're not included in the New Covenant. But, beloved, there is no such statement. You can search the New Testament high and low, looking for a statement that says that children are no longer included and that children should not be baptized, and you won't find it. Why not? Because the revelation of God in both the Old and New Testament is one revelation. You know, Baptists will often say to us, well, tell me where that is so in the New Testament. They'll force us, they try to force us to base infant baptism on the New Testament. You can't base it on the New Testament alone. You shouldn't base any doctrine on the New Testament alone because the whole Bible, both Old and New Testament, is one revelation of God. So we have no trouble going back to Genesis 17 and saying, you want to know where it's found in the Bible? It's found right there in Genesis 17, which I quoted earlier. You can't say, yeah, but that's Old Testament. We now live in the New Testament. Forget that. It's one revelation of God. And when God says everlasting, he means everlasting. As I said earlier. So there's no such statement. The New Testament simply carries on where the Old Testament leaves off. And in Acts 2.39, it's almost as though Peter is saying to the Jews, the promise is still. That's the meaning. It's not said. That word said, still is not included in the text, but that's the meaning. Paul, Peter is saying the promise is still unto you and to your children. A third argument that Baptists use is this. There's no evidence that the apostles baptized children. There's no evidence that the apostles baptized children. Now that's also true. We don't have any specific reference in the New Testament that the apostles baptized children, much less infants. But what we do have are several examples, not just one, but several examples of household baptisms in the New Testament. You think of the household of Cornelius and of Lydia and the Philippian jailer and, and Stephanus. And, and when you have so many of these household baptisms taking place, is it not reasonable to assume that at least in some of those households, maybe not in all of them, granted, but in some of those households, there were children and infants present. Now, again, I realize that's an argument from silence. 
but it's a reasonable supposition. And that's especially the case because the, the Greek word that's used for households in all these contexts means or refers, includes often children. That's the word that's used. It implies that there were children present. Well, this is the argument, and this is the counter-argument. And this is why we believe that children of believers must be baptized. And so this Lord's Day seeks to clarify the meaning of holy baptism over and against the teaching of Roman Catholicism, but also it clarifies the recipients of baptism over and against the teaching of Anabaptism. But how does this Lord's Day speak to us today? I struggle with that question. I mean, it's easy to say, well, here's a Lord's Day and it's historically conditioned and, and it's really referring to old theological debates that happened a long, long time ago. But how does, how does this Lord's Day speak to us, Reformed believers, today? Because, you know, we can say, well, yeah, we don't believe, like Roman Catholics, that the water of baptism actually washes away your sin. We don't believe with the Anabaptists that infants ought not to be baptized. Well, that's fine, but, but what does it say to us today? To us as Reformed believers. What I've observed, congregation, in my limited ministry is that Reformed people, I'm not just talking about free Reformed people, but, but Reformed people in general tend to veer off in one of two directions on this point. They either tend to veer off in the direction of Roman Catholicism or they tend to veer off in the direction of Anabaptism. Yes, I'm talking about Reformed people here. There are some within Reformed churches who tend to veer off on the side of Roman Catholicism. How do they do that? Well, not in the sense that they believe that the water of baptism washes away our sin. No Reformed person believes that. So in what sense do they veer off in this direction? Well, they do so by overestimating baptism. There are some in the Reformed community of churches who seem to think, and they might never say that in so many words, but they seem to think that as long as their children are baptized, they're safe. They have nothing more to worry about. They've got their ticket to heaven. Now again, they don't believe that the water of baptism washes away their sin. They believe that only the blood of Christ and the Spirit of Christ can do that. But they do believe deep down inside that being baptized makes them somehow right with God. I have a name for that. It's, a, it's called hypercovenantalism. Speak about hyper Calvinism, that's a different thing, but this is hyper covenantalism. This overemphasis on, on, on the meaning and the significance of holy baptism, this idea that, that our baptism somehow gives us a ticket into heaven. And you detect this in the preaching. You have to listen for it sometimes. But you can detect it in the preaching. And in the preaching in these kinds of churches, there's hardly any discrimination. No distinctions are ever made between converted and unconverted, between saved and unsaved. There's hardly ever a call to the unconverted, hardly ever a call, um, or, or rather there's hardly ever a sermon on the need for regeneration, on the need to be born again. The congregation tends to be viewed very optimistically as though everyone, including the children, are in a state of grace. They're all saved. We're all the children of God. And as a result, over time, everyone in the congregation comes to think of themselves as in a state of grace, when in fact they may not be. And that's a very dangerous way of thinking. And that kind of preaching and that kind of view of the congregation lends itself to this view. Baptism is a great blessing, 
Beloved, membership in the covenant of grace is a great blessing, but neither your baptism nor your membership in the covenant of grace can save you. Only Christ can save you. The water of baptism cannot wash away your sins. Only the blood and spirit of Christ can do that, and the blood and spirit of Christ become yours only when you repent of sin and you cry out to the Lord and you ask him to save you, then and only then will your sins be washed away. So there are some who tend to veer off in the direction of Roman Catholicism, but then there are others who tend to veer off in the opposite direction, in the direction of Anabaptism. Now, how do they do that? Well, they do that not by overestimating but by underestimating the value of baptism. Seeing very little value or even no value in baptism. And the reason why this is the case is because in some of these circles at least, it is believed that the promises of the covenant are only for the elect. And because of that, those promises really mean nothing until one proves or manifests the marks of election. And as a result of that, there's very little mention of baptism. It's almost like it's a forgotten subject. And parents will continue to baptize their children, but they tend to do so more out of custom than out of genuine conviction. And they never teach their children about the meaning and the comfort of their baptism, namely that that God, the triune God, comes to them as little infants even before they are aware that there is a God and he makes promises to them and he establishes a relationship of favor with them. And he says to them, if you will only turn from your sins and believe on me, I will most certainly, gladly, joyfully save you. That's never said. And so baptism is not a, is not a firm pleading ground anymore, but it's, a, but it's a sandy ground. It's not something that, that our children are, are busy with. See, our children ought to be busy with their baptism. They ought to be constantly, children, you ought to be constantly bringing your baptism before the Lord and saying, Lord, remember what happened when I was an infant. Remember the promises that you made to me. Remember the relationship that you established with me. Oh, Lord, I pray. Oh, fulfill those promises in my heart and in my life. Cause me to be born again. Change my heart. Change my life, Lord. Bring me to Christ. Wash me in his blood and in his Holy Spirit. This is what our baptism teaches us. This is what our baptism calls us to do. And we need to have spiritual ears to listen to our baptism. As I said last week, and we need to teach our children to listen to their baptism and to encourage them to come to the Lord with their baptism and ask the Lord to fulfill it in their lives. Oh, may that be the soul for every one of us congregation. May we avoid both of these tendencies, either the tendency towards Roman Catholicism or the tendency towards Anabaptism. And may our baptism lead us for the first time or again and again and again to the Lord Jesus Christ. May it humble us. May it show us and teach us our need for him. May it point us to his blood in whose blood alone we can be saved. Amen. Let us sing of the covenant faithfulness of our God.